gender equality is a given. With a bias towards hiring, sustaining and promoting women in the workplace is unravelled, where women have just as much chance of success as men, all women. Where the science is so compelling, the practical evidence so clear that the business case can no longer be questioned. And it's an incredibly strong business case. As Angul Gurria, the Secretary General of the OECD said at our G20 International Dialogue, women are the most underutilised asset in our economies. They are, in many countries, practically the only hope for sustained growth. Here, Gurria pushed for the notion of an all hands on deck. Currently, of all G20 nations, we have 82% labour force participation for men and 56%, that's 56% for women. But if we're talking about closing the gender gap, 25% reduction in the gender gap by 2025 is the target set by the G20. That's 120 million more women in the job market and a global economy that is 1.6% bigger. This has to correlate with closing the gender gaps within our organisations. And what an opportunity we have here this evening to not only imagine a world, but take steps towards this world through the practical applications of the work being done by Professor Iris Bonnet of Harvard University through her work on behavioural economics. Work that truly could make changes in the ways we all desire. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I would like to thank Professor Iris Bonnet of Harvard University, our guest speaker this evening and visiting professor at the US Studies Center at the University of Sydney. It has been a treat to have the world's leading scholar in behavioral economics and gender equality at our center. Iris has been a wonderful mentor and friend of the center and the W21 initiative. Our esteemed panel, Graham Head, New South Wales Public Service Commissioner, Dr. Andreas Lebrand of Monash University, and Carol Schwartz, one of Australia's most respected business leaders and a real pathmaker for all of us who want to make the world an equal place for women. Narelle Hooper, who will be moderating our panel this evening. It is an honour to welcome and shortly introduce Dr. Michael Spence, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney. Thank you for your leadership, both at the university and more broadly as a male champion of change and for your support of the W21 initiative at the US Studies Centre. The University of Sydney's Vice-Chancellor and Chancellor, Belinda Hutchinson, are both wonderful advocates for gender equality, women's empowerment and leadership. I would like to thank our sponsors and partners, in particular Iris's home institution, Harvard University, and the Behavioural Insights Group, Centre for Public Leadership, Harvard Kennedy School, and the Women in Public Policy Program, Harvard Kennedy School. The University of Sydney, and our other university partner, Griffith. The New South Wales State Government, and we have two departments supporting this initiative, New South Wales Trade and Investment, and the Department of Premier and Cabinet, and the Women's Leadership Institute Australia. These wonderful partnerships demonstrate the significance of this particular issue and the importance of collaboration to make change. I should introduce myself. I'm Melissa Graham McIntosh, the director of W21, the 21st Century Global Women's Initiative at the US Study Centre here at the University of Sydney. Coming together for tonight's event is at the heart of what we do at the US Study Centre. We identify and work through issues of shared significance for here, here in Australia and for the US to come up with innovative new solutions through research, public outreach and policy development. Solutions that can have global applications and we hope contribute to change. On the agenda this evening, we will learn about the science that can change organisations. And very importantly, what are we going to do about it? 
actionable ideas to design workplaces for gender equality. Because we know women aren't equal in the workplace, in participation, in opportunities, in pay, and in management. From before a woman steps through the door until the very tips of leadership. Despite progress being made at board level, we aren't necessarily seeing this flow into more women in senior management. Of the companies surveyed in the Credit Suisse Gender 3000 report, 4.5% of CEO roles in Australia are held by women, and in the US, this is even less, at 3.5%. I really am very proud to have here us here today uh, to join in the discussion, and I would like to um, first introduce the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney. The Vice-Chancellor, as I said, is a leader at this institution for more women in leadership, but he's also a leader being a male champion of change and a real advocate for change because he believes in it. So please join me in welcoming the Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Michael Spence. Thanks very much. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my, paying my respects to their elders past and present, particularly in this Reconciliation Week. We here at the University of Sydney are proud of the fact that people have been teaching and learning here for tens of thousands of years and invite all Australians to join in that pride with us. This is a crucial issue at a crucial time, women's leadership. Oh, we've come a long way in the last 100 years. Married women can work at the University of Sydney and in the civil service, something that they couldn't do just 30 years ago. Um, married women are even allowed to own property, something they couldn't do 100 years ago. Um, women can vote, something that within our great-grandmother's generation, um, it was possible to remember, and yet, and yet we are at a point of the most difficult change. When we talk to women at the University of Sydney, and isn't this true of almost all organizations, they say that what holds their career back is not policies and procedures or programs, it's deep-seated cultures and attitudes. And what's particularly challenging for me is that they say that it's behaviors tolerated by leadership at every level of the organization. And part of what we've been doing over the last couple of years is looking at ourselves as an institution to begin to think what it might mean to unpick some of that culture. That's not straightforward. We've had some success. We've moved, for example, in two years from 23% to 29% um, of women as full professors. But nevertheless, it's a tough job. I spoke this morning about the way in which, for example, my wife is constructed not only as a woman, but as an Asian woman. And intersectionality, of course, is an issue for so many of our women as they wear multiple identities and therefore fight against multiple labels. Think too about the way we think of women's work. Melissa talked a moment ago about 56% of women's labor force participation. Well, that's only if you count particular kinds of labor, the kinds of labor men pay, as being labor. Think about all the unpaid labor women do and the ways in which our economy, as well as our social life, would collapse if that work were not done. And you begin again to encounter the deep force of culture. To change culture, it's going to take men and women together who are reflective about their own practice and the practice of the institutions of which they are a part. And that's why it has been a great privilege to welcome Professor Bonnet to the university and why we are very proud of the fact that um, uh, the United States Study Center has taken this issue as one of their prime focuses over this period of time. It's important for the university, it's important for our country, but it's important if we are all going to flourish in the way we are confident that we can. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Chancellor. It is a huge honour to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Professor Iris Bonnet. Iris is Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Director of its Women and Public Policy Program. She's also the co-chair of the Behavioural Insights Group at the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School, an Associate Director of the Harvard Decision Science Laboratory and the Faculty Chair of the Executive Program Global Leadership and Public Policy for the 21st Century for the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders. From 2011 to 2014, she served at the, as the Kennedy School's Academic Dean. She's also on the Board of Directors of Credit Suisse. As I said, we've been privileged to have Iris with us at the US Studies Centre at the University of Sydney, where she facilitated an executive workshop today, and we're keeping her working tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Iris Bonnet. Thank you very much, Melissa, for this very kind introduction. And thank you for the US Studies Center for hosting me so kindly and the University of Sydney Vice Chancellor for giving me the opportunity to spend half a year in your beautiful city and your amazing country. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all tonight. And I'd also like to acknowledge my family who's sitting back there, my husband, Michael, and our two sons, Dominic and Luca, with whom I wouldn't be here tonight. For the next 15 minutes or so, I'd like to share with you some insights from behavioral economics that can be applied to closing gender gaps. In fact, let me start right away and talk to you a bit how we can design or redesign our organizations for gender equality and excellence. In fact, I'm gonna argue that we can learn from our brains, we can learn about how our brains functions and build on these insights to improve how our organizations function. Let me start with a very simple example, and that might not be the problem that you necessarily want to solve, but here is a little interesting fact. These are people who go to the gym, and they do take the escalator. Now, that's a bit odd, you might think. How could we change their behavior? So, of course, you could pay them to take the stairs, or you could take the escalator away. But let me show you a somewhat more creative mechanism to do this.
So I'm not going to argue that we can transform every stair in our lives into a piano, but I hope that I can suggest to you that, in fact, there are more stairs to be transformed than you might think of. So I want to talk about the promise of social design and want to give you a few more examples of how we can redesign our environments to make it a bit easier for what I'm going to argue are biased minds to get things right. Then I want to talk about why it's hard to get it right. In fact, I'm going to argue that this is mainly due to unconscious bias. And then finally, I'm going to end by giving you some examples of how we might redesign organizations to create gender equality. Let me start with this example here. Uh, this might sound like a difficult problem and not necessarily one that you would necessarily attack with behavioral insights. This should remind you of your tax forms, and it's one version of a tax form. A few colleagues of mine have been wondering about the following question. Does it matter where we sign our tax forms? So sometimes we make promises beforehand. For example, you swear that you will say the truth, but nothing but the truth when you are testifying in court. That's typically done beforehand. But when you sign, for example, your tax form or other forms, you sign at the end. It seems like a trivial little thing, but the question is, does it matter? So that's a typical kind of question that behavioral economists like myself like to study. So it does turn out, excuse me, it does turn out that it does matter. It turns out that if you sign beforehand, you'll be much more likely to report honestly than when you sign at the end. And why is that? Because when you sign beforehand, this will affect who you are as a person, will affect your identity. And you will want to see yourself as an ethical person. When you sign at the end, it's much more likely that you fall prey to something that we call self-serving biases, where you justify to yourselves that these expenses, after all, were justified, and the tax deductions that you made were probably justified. So that's design. It's a very simple design mechanism that has real tangible outcomes. But let me give you one more example from a very different area, and that is energy consumption. In fact, it turns out that my family and I are subjects involuntary, as it often is, in an experiment. These days, when we get our energy bill, we don't just learn how much we have to pay, but we also learn how we compare to our neighbors. This is a generic energy bill, not ours, but a generic energy bill that shows you how energy consumption of that particular household compares to the neighbors. And you can see whether you're better or worse than your neighbors. Now, this, in fact, is ours. Um, I wouldn't show it to you if we weren't great. Um, this is due to my husband insulating our roof, which really made a big difference. And we can also see how much energy we, consu we consume over the course of a year. Turns out, millions of households around the world are subject subjected to this kind of communication, and it has significantly decreased energy consumption. So how can we apply this to gender equality? So we're up for an uphill battle here because we're working with something that is called unconscious bias. And by its very term, it means it is implicit or unconscious and we're not necessarily aware of it. Let me introduce you to Heidi Roizen. Heidi is a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley and I'm teaching a case on her that describes what she's been doing, how she's building her network, how she's building her enterprises. And then we came up with the idea to not just teach the case with Heidi as the protagonist, but also with Howard as the protagonist. So half of the students get the same case, everything identical, only that the protagonist is called Heidi, which is her real name. And the other half of the students get the case with Howard as the real name. Sadly enough, but as you might now expect, we don't quite like Heidi. We think that Heidi is more power hungry, more self-promoting and more disingenuous than Howard because Heidi is violating gender norms. 
Our gender stereotypes are that women should be warm and should be cooperative, but shouldn't be competitive and assertive or strategic. So that's what we're up against. Let me give you another little il illustration here. In fact, now I want to put you to work. Have a look at this image and compare squares A and B for me. I presume that most of you see square A as being darker than square B. So let me cover the surroundings for you. And I presume most of you now see squares A and B as having the same color. Why is that? It turns out that we, I'm gonna go back because you're looking at me as if you didn't believe me. I am not tricking you, this is real tr really true. It turns out that we tend to think in categories, in social categories. And gender turns out, or sex turns out to be the master category, given that it's so visible and given that 50% of the population is male and 50% of the population is female. And what I'd like for you to think about is how you see the world. Do you see the world in patterns where certain people fall into certain categories, say nurses, and other people fall into other categories, say, engineers. Or see you, do you see the world kind of covered and therefore do not distinguish between A and B? Now, if you'd like to find out whether you have any of these biases, I invite you to log on to this webpage, harvardimplicit.edu, where you can measure your own unconscious biases. And I'm sad to tell you now that you will find out that you are sexist and racist and nationalist and many other things that you don't want to be. Because this is about all of us. This is not about pointing fingers. This is about good people, like the people in this room, trying to do the right thing, but not quite knowing how to get there. So what do we do? Let me offer you a few thoughts on possible solutions. The first one is pretty straightforward. Let data rule. Do not trust your intuition. When you trust your gut, it's very likely that your gut is going to be guided by stereotypes. Stereotypes are quick rules of thumb and quickly judging a person based on what he or she looks like, how tall he is, how heavy she is, whatever it might be about the person. You'll make very, very quick snap judgments and those judgments will be affected by your stereotypes. So data is actually very promising. Data have played a very important role in President Obama's re-election campaign. Some of you might have heard of that. Uh, Sasha Isenberg, who is on the slide here, has written a beautiful book on how the campaign has been totally driven by evidence. I suggest that this kind of evidence should guide how we think about gender equality. This is not about passion. This is not about wishful thinking. This is about real data, real evidence that we should also apply to human resource practices. There's a number of examples where data have played an important role. Let me just pick out one of them here on my slides, and that is MIT, the Massachusetts of, uh, Institute of Technology, realized about 15 years ago that they had a gender gap in their faculty, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of endowments. The female faculty were just a little concerned about uh, what was going on, and be it being MIT, it started to measure everything. It's actually quite beautiful. They started to measure the length of tables, of desks, of shelves, number of shelves, laboratories, staff, resources, everything. Turns out, while they didn't have a huge pay gap, they did have a huge gap in resources, a gender gap in resources. Data helped them understand what the issue was, and then they could figure things out. There's a number of organizations, I have two here, maybe just Edge to point this out, which now provide the tools to organizations to self-evaluate. This is relatively risk-free, but helps organizations understand, is it a promotion gap? Is it a pipeline gap? Is it an entry-level gap? Is it a pay gap? Maybe no gap at all. But before you fix, understand what is broken. In fact, one of my favorite books is a book by um, uh, Professor Tet Tetlock, 
which looks at expert judgments. It's a bit frustrating when I say it's my uh, favorite book because the conclusion of the book, after having evaluated hundreds and hundreds of expert forecasts, is that experts aren't much better than dart-throwing chimps. Do not trust your intuition, even if you are an expert. Typically, data, algorithms, big data, are better than human intuition. So rely on formal processes when you evaluate others, including formal objective measures of performance and structured interviews. One more thought around evaluations. So evaluating people is obviously very, very hard. And Heidi has been just one example of how hard it is for us. So what do we do with Heidi? Ideally, we would do exactly what many large orchestras are doing these days. They evaluate their musicians behind curtains. They have musicians come in and audition behind curtains, so they're blind to the demographic characteristics of the musicians. It turns out that has increased the chances that a woman is hired by 30 percentage points. Blind auditions, unfortunately, aren't what most of you or even in my job as academic dean when helping select professors, could do. So I'm trying to find alternatives to these curtains. And here's one insight that is generally applicable to lots of different decisions that we make. People, human beings, do not make absolute judgments. Everything you perceive, that you evaluate, that you judge, is relative. Whether you're hot or cold right now has something to do with the temperatures that you used to. Whether you think my accent is a bit strange has something to do with the accents that you're used to. Whether you like a coffee that you drink has something to do with the coffees that you're used to. Same thing for people. When you evaluate somebody who is applying for a job as a nurse, there's going to be this little referent here, the stereotype in your head. And that stereotype is going to tell you that nurses typically are female and he just doesn't look the part. So that's what we're trying to overcome. We're trying to overcome that little stereotype in your head. And how we do that is by making you compare the applicant that is in front of you with another human being. Turns out that just one comparison is already enough for the gender bias to go away. So comparisons are very helpful to calibrate your judgments. We've been lucky to um, apply this to our hiring and promotion procedures at Harvard, where we're now bundling decisions in order to be able to compare candidates more objectively. So evaluate comparatively whenever you hire and promote candidates. Let me talk quickly a bit uh, about risk-taking. Risk has been something that obviously is with us in any decision, many decisions that you take in your lives. Here's one example where uh, Gender differences are actually relatively prevalent. Most women, most, tend to be a bit more risk-averse than men. One of my former students, Katie Baldiga, was interested in understanding whether this affects test-taking, and I thought that was a good subject for at least half of the audience in this room. And what she looked at was multiple-choice tests. In fact, these are the standardized tests that are absolutely crucial in the United States for getting into college. Turns out that these are multiple choice tests where you have five possible answers. You can either uh, check a box. If you don't know the answer, you might want to guess. Or you skip the questions. There's a small penalty associated with guessing wrongly. But if you can exclude one of the alternatives, it turns out it's rational to guess. You probably know where I'm going. Women being slightly more risk averse are less willing to guess. Women skip. They just skip the questions. It costs them 70 points on the SAT. It's about 10% of the score, of the final score, is just due to their gender, controlling for ability, controlling for how much they would have known. The happy ending of the story is that the SAT will be changed starting next year. The penalty is going to go away and therefore, we expect the gender gap to completely disappear. There's other ways in which risk can matter and in which stereotypes threaten us. It's called, in psychology, it's called stereotype threat. 
What it means is that there are cues in the environment that will activate certain parts of your identity. In a given moment, I might feel woman, economist, Swiss, Harvard professor, mother. Any of these things might be activated by cues in the environment. Turns out that when you complete tests, sometimes you're asked to fill out demographic questionnaires beforehand. When we ask boys and girls to check off the box, whether, uh, their gender box, whether they're male or female, that will affect their test taking. Boys will do worse in writing and reading, and girls will do worse in math. It's even more profound. The test has been done with Asian American girls. When you remind them of being Asian, they'll do better in math because Asian is associated with math. When you remind them of their gender, they do worse in math. Stereotype threat is quite profound, although it is hard to believe how strongly it affects our behaviors. And it's actually really simple to remove. Just don't have people check boxes before they fill out tests. The last thing I want to leave you with is that role models are really powerful. I'd recommend to you a series that has just started to air on Australian television, highlighting Australian role models who work flexibly. It's actually beautifully done. I've just watched the first one uh, with a lawyer talking about how he combines work and life with his wife being a member of parliament. Role models do matter. These are Indian women who have been assigned as village leaders across India. The best quota experiment to date. In 1993, India amended its constitution to have a third of all village heads be female. And the beauty of the experiment was that the third was drawn randomly out of a hat. And so we could actually evaluate what difference difference really makes. So researchers have been following that experiment for almost 20 years now, and it turns out that if you have been exposed to a female village leader at least twice, that's eight years, stereotypes about what a political leader looks like start to change. And the last finding that's just been published in Science now says that parents now feel that one of the core career aspirations for their daughters is to become a politician. So you can change mindsets. Seeing really is believing. And we should care because, yes, there is a business case, and I'm going to end with a slide on the business case, but you should really care about gender equality because it can be a matter of life and death. A few years ago, The Economist had this cover entitled Gender Side. And what it talks about is that the UN now estimates that 158 million girls are missing in Asia. They're missing because of sex-selective abortion, because of infanticide and neglect during the first five years. They're missing because women are worth less to their parents. It turns out that a beautiful study has been done, which can show that if you increase women's economic opportunities, that will affect how parents treat their daughters. It increased survival chances, it increased the likelihood that parents sent their daughters to school without, and that is important, hurting their sons. So it is possible to increase the size of the pie and make everyone better off. But of course, I can't end without quickly touching on the business case because so much has been written on it. Yes, there is a business case for gender equality, and yes, there are correlations between companies which are more diverse and their bottom line. This is a study by Credit Suisse, which looked at 2,500 of the biggest companies in the world. And what you can see is an interesting reversal around the financial crisis, where post-financial crisis, boards of at least one or more women, the companies with boards of at least one or more women started to outperform companies with zero women. So let me summarize. Do rely on data. Do not trust your intuition. Use comparisons to calibrate your judgments. Remove stereotype threat. And create role models in your organizations 
That could be you, yourself, your professor, could also go as far as changing the portraits on the walls of your organizations. Go ahead and nudge change and have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. That was absolutely like today, thought-provoking. I know everyone will want more of you, <laughs> uh, which we're going to do now. Um, I would like to introduce a leader in her own right, former editor of Boss Magazine, corporate advisor, company director, broadcaster, amazing woman, driving force behind the Australian Financial Review and Westpac 100 Women of Influence Awards. Please welcome Narelle Hooper, who will introduce our panel. Hi. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. I, I did have a suitably... Um, I was going to crack a joke to kind of loosen us all up, but then I took the implicit, implicit associations test, and now I'm absolutely terrified. I'm going to be racist, sexist, overly nationalist, and probably make an unwitting joke against someone who's either too tall or too short, so my apologies for, for the lack of that. Um, I looked at that last um, slide, and I'm thinking of the lost opportunity, our, not just our society, but our globe, has as a result of what must be something that we, can, we all have some control over, and it made me also profoundly sad, but at the same time, very optimistic that we can take it in our hands and do something about it. And so now I'm going to introduce our panellists who are going to be here with uh, Iris to help us have a conversation tonight. And the topic is, what works to close the gender gap and what are we doing about it? So hopefully we can learn some very practical insights uh, 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 with the nudges and so forth. And I'm going to invite your questions as well tonight. So first up, I'd like to introduce Graham Head. He's the New South Wales Public Service Commissioner. He's had about three decades uh, working across federal and state government. He's terribly experienced. He's a wonderfully warm man, and he's got some very interesting insights to share, a great sense of humour also. Graham, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Andreas Lebrant, who's the Associate Professor of Economics at Monash University. Now, Andreas comes to us via... Uh, from Zurich via Chicago, and has been in Melbourne for a number of years now. When I rang him the other day, he was um, doing the equilibrium man thing. He was home working with his uh, two-year-old and four-year-old, and um, it sort of fits well with academic life to a point. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Andreas. And Carol Schwartz, who's the director of Stockland and the director of the Bank of Melbourne. Carol is also guiding the male uh, the Male Champions of Change, which is one of the initiatives in the property sector, in the corporate sector. Carol, welcome. And Carol is, after the kind words from Melissa, Carol's the ginger behind my spine as well, and a number of people also. So please put your hands together and welcome our guest. Now, I have many questions, but um, Iris... We'll come to some of the nudges shortly, but I looked at that business case for greater gender equity in the corporate sector, and now we've ha we have 20 years of data, pretty much. We've got a, lot, a body of data so saying that organisations perform financially uh, better, they're more innovative, uh, better on people's mental health and so forth. Now, I know there's an issue around correlation versus causes, and we could go down that path. But if the, that evidence suggests uh, it, it's so compelling, how is it that it's not actually happening more in our organisations? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think partly, let me start on the optimistic note. The optimistic note is that many of us would like to promote change but don't know quite how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I hope that is part of the answer, that it's actually hard to get it right and whether you sign in the beginning or at the end, it's not necessarily intuitive. So I think part of the answer, honestly, is that we don't have all the recipes ready. Mm -hmm. um, now, a bit more pessimistic note is that some of us just don't want to change. Some of us actually like being with people who look like ourselves. In fact, we should be quite clear that this 
ugly term, homophobia, is real. People do ha tend to have an in-group preference, and we're much more likely to associate with people who look exactly like we do. So I'm trying to imagine what this organisation looks like where we are able to tap the talents of all the people working within it. And Carol, I'm trying to imagine in the corporate life, what would that look like? 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when you look at the qualifications, the educational qualifications, the, the sort of levels of experience that women have, there's actually no reason why there shouldn't be 50% of our business leadership being women and 50% of you know, our workforces in corporate life being, being women. There's no reason at all. Do you think there would, would there be a, a, a dramatic difference in the look and feel of those organisations and, and their contribution? Absolutely. And how would that Absolutely. be? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that... Um, you know, firstly, um, I think that by introducing diversity in the way organisations operate, um, you're going to have enormous consequences. So, for example, if you've got 50% of your leadership being female, then you're probably going to have a lot more focus on the issues around childcare, flexibility, what that's going to look like for both men and women, and also you introduce new normals. Okay, um, things become normalised, which are exceptional now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that once that happens, organisations have a lot more opportunity to be more innovative around the sorts of environments that they create, and therefore it, it just fosters innovation generally mm. within the organisations. Mm. Let's just briefly sketch the scene. I'm, I'm not sure how across the numbers everybody uh, in the room is, but, but we've got, we're educating roughly 50% uh, women through universities and so forth. Uh, the minute you hit your working life, there's a bit of a slowdown, your pay might not, you know, you start to fall behind the pay. By the time, if you progress through corporate life, by the time we get to the top, it's a tiny pyramid, it's less than 10% end up as CEO in the corporate suite, it's not much more. Mm. We're having a bit more success with boards, so that we've got a number of initiatives there. Yes. So what have we got, the 30 I think um, Iris mentioned it today, I think we're at about 20%, mm. um, or someone mentioned yeah. it today at the meeting, yeah. So I, I, I guess... the ASX 200. So yeah. we seem to be having some success would you say, with uh, well, getting you know, people onto boards? In, in yeah. some areas. Yeah. I mean, we only have two women on our federal cabinet. I don't think that's much of okay. much to get excited about. No. And I actually think that... Um, I wasn't... I, w I hadn't gone to politics, but I'm glad yes, you raised well, it because you, it's a really know, important thing. You know, the reason I bring yeah. politics up is actually because I think that um, we have such poor leadership in that area that is actually impacting on business. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. If you have women who are cabinet ministers who are attending meetings with business, business is going to think twice about going to those meetings with only with, with all male teams. The fact is, if there are all men in those positions, business is not really thinking about, well, is it appropriate for me to bring along an all-male team? And I think that um, it's, it's really having an impact and a very negative and regressive impact mm. on business. Iris, you've been here for a number of months ma now. What's, what's the difference in the, the tenor of the debate here versus the US in terms of bringing gender equality into organisations at those various levels? I don't know the debate is so different, actually. Mm. Um, I think the debate is quite similar across the world where you have organizations such as the Male Champions of Change, mm -hmm. which promote change um, and which I think do tremendous work here in Australia. You have similar um, groups in the US or in parts of Europe or other places around the world. Uh, honestly, I think the, the dynamics are quite, quite similar. Mm -hmm. I think some of the countries that are role models that might stand out are the Scandinavian countries. That is actually quite amazing. Um, and it's funny, uh, about two years ago, I gave a talk in Sweden, and I talked about gender equality, and the audience was outraged that they only have 45% women in parliament. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything's relative. <laughs> everything's relative. Um, 
but there's something to be learned for all of us um, from the Scandinavian countries. Some, some to learn there. Um, Graham, I wanted to come to you in the public sector. Now, a little known fact in the room is that your, your organisation is one of the biggest employers in the country. Well, the New South Wales public sector yeah. is the biggest employer That's in the right. country. So, so it's got a head count of around 400,000. It's about 11% of the New South Wales uh, labour force. So mm -hmm. it's big. Um, my little part of that is only about 120 people, but our reform agenda is about transformation across that very large workforce. Yeah. Now, um, drawing on some of Iris's behavioural insights today, you're, you've been doing some, you've got some quite innovative work going on in terms of the, uh, those 400,000 employees in the state sector in New South Wales. What are you doing and, and what are you doing differently? Well, at the heart of the reform agenda is really, uh, I guess, a modernisation of the way we think about managing people in mm -hmm. the public sector to make sure that you know, these very important, enduring public institutions that we work in have access to the best talent and that our society is reflected in its, um, in its own institutions. Um, so most people focus on the legislative reforms that we've been implementing, but they're really a tool to enable change in a number of areas. In relation to the things we're talking about tonight, very important work was done in the 1970s through equal employment opportunity legislation to start addressing very profound inequities of access to employment at the time. But actually, our processes and frameworks haven't evolved very much since that time. So one of the things we're doing is actually saying, well, diversity is one of the things that has to be at the heart of the way you plan a workforce. It's not a, an add-on compliance function, that it's central to thinking about the right kind of workforce aligned to what your organisation does. And related to the, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. techniques or more objective approaches of assessing people, through what we're doing in reforming the way the sector actually recruits people. We're trying to inject uh, many more of these more objective processes uh, and techniques to try and make sure that our recruitment processes are indeed as blind as possible. Mm -hmm. So how does having diversity as a central, it's a core principle, how does that change? What's an example for me every day of how that changes things? Well, I think the problem we have at the moment in, yeah. uh, in the sector, and this is, I mean, I'm talking in generalisations, yeah. obviously, but we don't think very much about explicitly what our business model is. People kind of assume they all know. And when a position becomes vacant, mm -hmm. a decision's taken somewhere in the organisation to fill that, per, uh, fill that position. So you end up with a workforce that is really the consequence of an, an accretion of lots of little decisions that is not really driven by people thinking about what do we look like today, what's changing in terms of what citizens expect, how policies are changing, how do we align our workforce to that and how do we use things like the way we recruit, the way we develop people, the way we promote people to make sure that alignment happens. So diversity being at the centre is about um, incorporating that into your basic business process design. The public sector is often quite complacent because we do comparatively well. Two thirds of the public sector are women, but only a third of people in leadership positions are women. Okay. Um, and uh, there hasn't been anything much in the last 10 years that's been about actively trying to address that. So these processes are about uh, really turning that situation around. And in fact, we engaged Sydney Uni, Uni to do some work because our own employee <laughs> survey and workforce profile showed that um, you know, there was this flip around at the senior executive point, and yet interestingly, a very, the very large majority of women said that gender was not a barrier to career progression. So we wanted to understand 
what was happening, right. mm -hmm. why it was happening. And there's not just right. bias in recruitment processes, there's bias in the way roles are designed and organisations are designed. So bringing this to the centre is about yeah. encouraging people to think about it very differently. That, that's fascinating that um, mm -hmm. they didn't think gender was an issue. Um, Andreas, do you see that as essentially a, a gendered discussion? In a way, get your, your field just, um, I, I didn't, I neglected to fill in is competitiveness, negotiation, affirmative action programs and so forth. And you also director of Merit, which is the research uh, unit. Yes, yes. Uh, let me give you a, a personal experience which, which brought me to this topic. So that was in 2009 when I was a postdoctoral scholar in, mm -hmm. in Bloomington, Indiana University. And it was an inc incredible, exciting time. It was the only time I went to a lecture and got goosebumps. <laughs> and I even get goosebumps Except now. <laughs> so the reason was that there she was, Lynn came to the lecture. So um, Lynn is Eleanor Ostrom. Um, and it was the day where it was announced that she won the Nobel Prize in, in economics. So the first woman winning the Nobel Prize in economics. And it was just amazing for all of us. What I found disturbing, though, was afterwards all these discussions about her and her being a woman and that being the reason for her winning the Nobel Prize. I thought that, I, I thought that was quite shocking because her contributions were, I mean, she was, in my view and in the view of many others, totally worthy of winning a Nobel Prize. So that brought me to the topic. And what I was looking for were simple tools to, to help close the gender gap. Let me give you one example of, of the kind of studies I've done, and that has been done in a series of natural field experiments in the US with um, thousands of job seekers. So there's this idea that women are less likely to negotiate, and that, mm -hmm. you know, that can accumulate in gender differences in, in earnings over the lifetime of millions. So we tried to find out whether this is actually the case, and what can we do to, to reduce this, this gender gap in willingness to negotiate. So we advertised positions and we specified a wage. Your wage is this amount of money per hour. And what we observe is that in this environment, lots of men try to negotiate for a higher wage, <laughs> whereas women are quite hesitant, but at the same time even offering to work for a lower wage. So what we did is we placed the same advertisement, but we added one word. We said the wage is dollar x per hour negotiable. So we made it explicit um, that there's room for negotiations. Um, we took out the ambiguity here. And what happened is that the rate of women who were willing to negotiate uh, doubled, um, and hardly any woman tried to, to offer for work for a lower wage at the same time. So in the end, what, what this simple, simple nudge, let's call it nudge, did is mm -hmm. this one word was, close altogether the difference in willingness to negotiate for a higher wage. So I believe there's, this is one example, and there are many others which can help um, affecting gender differences in, in wages or other things. You, you bring up something there, which is, uh, <clears throat> we've tried a lot of stuff. You know, if you talk to uh, chief executives, they say, this is the hardest thing I do as a CEO. Uh, and I can't, I haven't been able to move the dial. We haven't been able to move the needle. And we, the interventions call, seem to me to fall into a couple of categories. We've got fix the women, as I think about it. And lately, we've had some more stuff about fixing the men, which is kind of giving diversity training, um, helping people build trust and, and so forth. Um, Iris, I wonder just how successful the fix the women approaches are. Where do they sit in all of this, in, in perhaps finding nudges to get them to negotiate more or be more um, yeah. um, outspoken? You know, honestly, we probably have to do all of them. We have to fix the women and the men, and most importantly, we have to fix the system. And in many ways, uh, what Andreas is doing is fixing the system, not necessarily fixing the women. We're changing the system, we're changing how we advertise. There's nothing in an ad that says you can't talk about that is negotiable. There's nothing that says that you can't talk about cooperation is valued. Or there's nothing that says that, you know, you could do lots of things in advertisement. So how we frame things, the kinds of words that we use, where we place the ad, 
is actually part of fixing the system for me and not actually fixing the women. Fixing the women would mean that I just blindly encourage women and say, oh, you're not negotiating? You have to negotiate, just go out there and negotiate. And what um, Andreas and others have found is that's when women experience backlash because negotiating assertively, so women aren't just stupid, obviously not, um, but women know that when they negotiate assertively, they will fall into the trap that Heidi Roizen fell into. Mm -hmm. Then women will be less liked. And so therefore, they're trying to avoid that stereotype threat. But if you, make, if you make it very explicit that this is negotiable, then this empowers women, entitles them to negotiate. So it really is more about fixing the system than fixing either gender. Mm -hmm. Carol, um Stockland's a listed company, Bank of Melbourne, um, large, large startups. What's, um, and I know companies are spending a lot of money on this now, it's on everyone's agenda. Yeah. But what, from your experience in those companies, what does work and what do they try and what, you know, what's some stuff that doesn't work? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that Iris is absolutely right. I mean, the fact is we need paradigm shifts in the way our organisations are structured and what we consider to be normal. And um, I know that um, at both Stockland and Bank of mm -hmm. Melbourne, there are in fact large numbers, I think we have over 40% in both organisations of women in senior management. Mm -hmm. um, and in Bank of Melbourne, there's also close to 50% of women are on the EXCO team. Um, in Stockland, unfortunately, we're not getting the women through to the EXCO team, and it's something we discuss all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's because um, of the very traditional male-dominated roles in property. So we don't have the women who are head of residential communities, who are head of um, uh, commercial mm -hmm. property um, and uh, retirement living. Although retirement living, we do have some fantastic senior women who will come through into those roles. Um, and the woman that we have on Exco is a fabulous company secretary, corporate counsel. Um, we try absolutely everything. We make sure that um, women have the same opportunities about development and leadership training as, as men do. We make sure that um, women are sponsored and, and have the same access to to the exco as men do. But, you know, look, I've been talking about this stuff for 25 years, mm -hmm. and I thought that by now I would have made some sort of difference for my daughters who are coming through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the change is absolutely glacial. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because um, we are um, still working in an environment that was developed probably 150, 200 years ago and um, we're not doing anything to really create, um, a, a, you know, a, a shock to the system. So, you know, people ask me if, if I support quotas, and I say I do, mm -hmm. because I think that we need to have a paradigm shift to get women into senior roles, to get women through organisations. Um, you can call them targets and you can attach KPIs to them or you can call them quotas. I don't care if it's a Q word or a T word, but we need something in place that creates a paradigm shift to get the women through. We have the most fantastic resource of women in this country, well-educated, bright, innovative, all there ready to contribute to our GDP, to the growth of um, innovation in our nation and we're being underutilised. It's completely nuts. Yeah. So bring mm -hmm. on the paradigm shifts that are going to change the status quo and let's get moving. Mm. Andreas, your response? You've had a, a, a lot to say about affirmative action programs and, and quotas, targets. Yes, yes. I, I, I guess if you, for instance, take a look back at the G20 in, in Brisbane, that was also a topic that was heavily debated there. And it's a very controversial topic and, and people have very strong opinions. Well, you can share yours. <laughs> I guess, uh, I think like most, I have a feeling, yes, we should do it, but at the same time, I feel there's something wrong about this, to be honest. Um, what, what I find more importantly, though, is that if we implement quotas, we want to understand what they are actually doing. 
and, and we have very little knowledge on what quotas do. It's a massive shock to the system, so two years uh, studying economics in Chicago has, have told me that that may have uh, severe consequences. So we want to understand what are the consequences. Um, and we want to also protect women in, in such an environment because affirmative action may help women quite a bit, but at the same time, it may hurt them also. And there's some research also on this. So I think we need to be very careful um, in, in just going ahead and implementing uh, quotas. Um, to give you an example, one of the things that, that I have observed in experiment is by implementing quotas, you increase the rate of competition, and, and not necessarily good competition among women quite a bit. There are lots of more positions now for women available, mm. and they're fighting over these positions. Mm. But I'm picking up on Iris's point about, for example, in India, that there were knock-on effects some years down the track. So at what point are you quantifying the, the negative effects versus a potential uh, new role model? Right, and I, I, this is... I, mean, I would have liked to have done this study in India. I mean, I think it's yeah. a great study. Now, I've talked quite a bit about this study when I was also in Chicago, and yeah. I guess the common response in Chicago is, well, but that's India. It, it, it's a very particular environment, and it has shown a lot of tremendous positive impacts mm -hmm. that have come, but have taken quite a bit of time also. So we need to be aware of this when, when we implement quotas that it takes time to to, to really leave an impact. And, and there are also some things which... Can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because um, I, I find it interesting that you think that it's a problem for women to compete for jobs, which men do all the time. So what's, what's the difference? Yeah, so I'm not talking about uh, competition in a traditional sense. I'm talking about this doggy -e dog mentality. So, I'm ta so what we find is, um, to be precise, what we find is an increase in sabotage. So, sorry? An increase in sabotage. Excuse me. That's somebody who's <laughs> clearly very upset about quotas. I think we are sabotaged. <laughs> Sounds like the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> so, but, but you know, we'll that's, that yeah. but, but that's really that's interesting. That's not my stomach. I mean, if we're, if we're operating, you know, in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, um, and men are able to compete in that world, why aren't women able to compete in that world as well? Oh, they are most definitely able to compete in this world, mm -hmm. but I guess... That's not what we aspire to. I think what we want is an environment which is collaborative, despite having a lot of competitions. All right, I'm going to move on because I'd like to get to some questions from the audience also. Um, Iris, some other... Um, so, so what's the evidence support? The evidence supports... Um, you, to me, it was quite a shock to hear that the diversity training a lot of organisations are doing there's no evidence to support that actually works. So, yeah, um, I, I'm going to be very careful here because we are the training institution. And so, of course, I believe in education more generally, yeah. which is a very good thing. But no, no, I want to be more specific. Um, there, the evidence that diversity training fixes our minds is not there. Why is that? Because, as I said, much of the bias that we're now talking about is unconscious. So even if you and I now go through some diversity training and agree that tomorrow we don't want to discriminate the male nurse or don't want to discriminate the female engineer, it is very hard for us not to do so. Mm -hmm. So that's why diversity training generally doesn't do too much because it stays at the surface and we really need to dig deeper. Uh, so yes, but what we can do in trainings, that's why I don't want to generalize, uh, training around leadership skills or even negotiation skills uh, can be very helpful. Mentoring and sponsoring can be very helpful. Or even training around how we can change the systems to create more equal playing fields can be very successful. But also I want to be careful what kind of training we're talking about. Some trainings have, have been shown to have huge impacts and others that just try to fix our minds okay. are a bit less successful. Another thing I wanted to, to see, we see a lot lately about um, uh, we're going to have a woman on the shortlist, we're going to have a woman on the interview panel, and that's supposed to help. Now, from my understanding of your work, that actually sets up a minority situation. It's counterproductive. 
Is that, is that correct? So I think there, yes, there's two things that you raised which are both very important. Um, gender diversity on uh, evaluation committees or selection committees is not a quick fix because we all share these biases. In fact, generally, to many people's surprise, we find little difference in who the observer is, whether it's a man or a woman, okay. because we all see the same kind of world. So it's much more important what we see than who we are, is the first big insight. And then the second one that is also very important that you raise, Narel, is do we have a critical mass of whatever the underrepresented group is? It turns out that if you have very, very few people on a team or on a selection committee, for example, women, or for example, men, then they turn into tokens relatively quickly. And they are asked to be the spokespeople, so to speak, for their group, when in fact, they might like to be on the team because they are mathematicians or because they are psychologists. So I think both of those, those issues are important for us to think about. Thank you. Graham, what's, um, what's been your experience in terms of that, those kind of building in those, structure, those kind of uh, representative structures and so forth? Well, the public service is very good at compliance and very good <laughs> at workarounds. So there is a bit of what Joan Didion, the American journalist, refers to as magical thinking. You know, that, well, we've got the panel and it complies, therefore it will produce mm. the right outcome. Even although if you look at the data, the data tells you it's not producing mm -hmm. uh, the sort of outcomes you would expect. Um, so I think every, I mean, this is the third time I've heard Iris speak and we find this way of thinking is, um, you know, very important in terms of what we're trying to achieve, you know, public, public service selection processes, if you think about them, um, have typically involved people writing an essay about themselves in which, surprise, surprise, they turn out to be the hero of their own story. <laughs> and then, then the only place we test the bona fides in that essay is in an interview, which is a notoriously unreliable process. And we think the fact that we've got, you know, the committee made up of the right configuration somehow or other solves for all of those other design weaknesses in the process. The sorts of things we've heard about tonight are actually uh, measures that I think go a long way towards correcting the flaws in those processes. So. So I just wanted to pull out a little bit about that. So that, so that the classic interview thing that we all do, we apply for the job. This, I'm curious about whether this still happens in your organisations. Uh, you go to a number of interviews, and sometimes it's structured, sometimes it's a bit more. And that, from your work, uh, that was the thing that really struck me, Iris, that it's... I'm on a no-brainer. I'm not going to get the right person. <laughs> so, so, Carol, do you, um, is, that, is that process still sort of happening in organisations you're familiar with? Yeah, it does. But, you know, Iris pointed out something really interesting today um, in, in our session, and that was that she doesn't advocate, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, for people to be interviewed by a, by a selection committee that you should actually be interviewed by individuals and then those individuals get together and discuss, you know, the candidates. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating because, uh, I mean, I don't know, Graham, but um, all the monsters out again. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, in the public service, do you actually interview um, b by panel or...? Yes. Dating version of one on one discussions yep. and then the um, interviewers coming together. And it was very interesting. We've only done it a couple of times, but I think it was a far less stressful experience for the candidates yeah. because they're having a one on one conversation. It also forces you into the discipline of, you know, asking the identical questions in the same sequence, all those sorts of things, which turns out to be quite important in terms of the quality of the process. So it would be a very big shift for the public sector. And I think while we've built a framework that's quite elegant around these new recruitment processes, we're a long way from being able to optimise all of the benefits because it's a very new way of doing business. Even 
the fact that you are encouraged uh, to choose the right kind of capability assessments for every role now. People are defaulting almost automatically to using psychometric assessments, some of which are very appropriate for some roles, but of course you need to be matching very carefully the right kind of assessment mm -hmm. tools depending on the capabilities that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we need to rethink the role of the interview in the process and then the way we structure the mm -hmm. interview as well. Now the really interesting thing in all of this is that at no point we haven't got to work-life balance and um, about, you know, flexibility and all the rest of it, um, because it, all of the focus now is on those interactions in recruitment, selection, promotion, and, and so forth. It's, it seems to be part of it. Um, I, I'd like to start taking questions now. So, um, and I know there's some people who are really keen here. So if you could put your hand up, um, keep your questions short. There's, I think there's a microphone to come around. Yes, and, um, and we'll come to you. If you could keep your question tight and... Uh, leave the soapbox at home. Well, that would be great. To the this one here. About um, I, I've been asked by um, uh, Liz Broderick to be the facilitator for the property male mm. champions of change. These are the um, industry leaders in the property industry who have come together as a group really concerned yeah. about the fact that we do not have significant numbers of women in leadership mm. roles and, and understanding that, they, that there is a very strong business case and they really want to, um, want to make sure that mm. we do maximise the potential of the organisations. Each one of them have said that through the focus groups that they're running in their organisations, flexibility is the number one issue. Right. Flexibility, how to structure it within the organisation, how it's going to work for everybody, not just women, but men as well. And yeah. uh, it's a really interesting issue because I think that then again it goes to the, the old paradigms of what does a workplace look like, what do the hours of work look like, how is this all structured, you know, we're still working on these old 150 year old models and no one's had the disruptive thought about how, how this could work completely differently. Mm. On that score, and there's a question here, and I think there's one, just put your hands up if you wouldn't mind so we can see. So one there, one there. And I'll, while you're coming down, Telstra um, took a deep breath and moved to all roles flex and that after a pilot project. So the default uh, status was that for the 34,000 employees, they were going to be able to negotiate flexibility with their manager. Now took some getting used to, um, some managers weren't comfortable mm. about that at all. Really interesting response, the engagement scores at the organisation rose uh, and the number of people who said they felt they had the flexibility to do their job also increased and that seems to me, that was under one of the male champions of change interventions, that did to me seem mm. to be quite a successful approach. So Georgie and then we'll come to the other, yes too. Thank you. Is that on? My question is about, Carol, I agree with you wholeheartedly that we need a paradigm shift. I also <clears throat> I think that so much of the conversation um, around things like quotas and targets is so fraught because there is the, and, and obviously some of the concerns about quotas perhaps are well-founded, but what strikes me as interesting is there is so much evidence to show the business case as Iris um, showed and yet we have all this caution around mm. changing it. And it seems odd because we know that this is a change that would create better results um, for, for individual businesses, for the society, for the whole bit. Mm. And yet we are so far from a point of people actually saying, because I would have more time for someone saying actually quotas aren't the solution, but this is the other solution and this is what we're going to do about it. I'm not mm. singling you out mm. individually for saying that. I'm just saying I don't see that sort of leadership. I don't see anyone who's saying no quotas aren't work, uh, won't work coming to the table and saying, well, actually, I've thought through some other solutions and this is how we're going to action it. Okay. Right, to pick up. Carol, do you want to pick up on that? And then oh, I thought Andre that was being addressed to Andreas. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can say some words. I, I don't want to go into details what evidence shows and, and what evidence does not show, but I think we have very, very little evidence on what quotas do besides increasing the share of women in workforce or at, at the higher levels. And I'm, I'm not sure this one measure is the one we should only care about. 
Let, let me say this as general as possible. Whenever you disrupt a system, and here the system is that there are lots of more men in higher positions than women, something will change dramatically, and not everything will be as we expect it, it will be. And I think it's important to try to anticipate what are the things we, the unintended effects, and try to be proactive about this. I'm not saying quotas are a bad thing, but I'm saying lots of things will happen, and we should not, we should have a good idea what will happen. Another example I'll give you, and that goes back to the Indian case, actually, to this great study. So, one of the things that happened is when you ask men about, about their taste of female leaders, it actually worsened over time. They, tried, they, they saw a closer connection to women being even a, a, a good chief, a, a good leader, but at the same time, they started to dislike women more in leadership. Sort of a weird finding, but, but there is some backlash. And, and the other thing we find in experiments is also um, that affirmative action programs may give uh, men a moral license to do things that we don't want them to do. Because they regard it as unfair, such as sabotaging women that, that go up for promotion, for instance. They don't sabotage each other already? Oh, men sabotage each other all the time. That's, not <laughs> that's nothing new. But, but there will be an increase in yep. sabotage of women in, in this scenario. And that's a problem, not just because of the sabotage itself. So the other thing we find is that women anticipate this hostile environment that may create it mm. in such a situation and then actually are less likely to, to compete. It's one of the findings we find. But that's very preliminary evidence, and all I'm saying is there's very little evidence at this point what quotas actually right. do. So I think we need, we need to learn more. Right. Graeme, you want to pick up, and then um, I guess Iris, I'll come to you. Just to, to you know, um, explore our own example, and I'm not you know, an expert on... You know, what's better, quotas or targets. Um, but I think it probably relates to the point that was made in Iris's presentation, that before you decide what to do, you've got to actually understand the, what the problem looks like in your actual context. So in the public sector, which is typically done comparatively well, we're not looking for things that are a massive shock to the system. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the what we call the Westminster bit of the public sector, so the departments of state, which are about 70,000 of the 400,000 people who work in the sector, in the senior executive roles, women comprise about 42, 43%. So the approach we're taking is targets, very transparent reporting on those targets, the work I've talked about in terms of improving the um, quality of recruitment processes, but also looking very carefully at um, workforce flexibility, those things taken as a package. So I think you've got to start with what does the problem look like here mm -hmm. and be thinking about things like the extent to which you need very bold things that shock the system or conversely, that you have pretty solid foundations in there and you're looking to kind of stretch people um, harder and faster in a direction that they've already been going. Iris, um, you um, spoke to me about Google as being really prepared to try some, some new stuff. They were really prepared to experiment on this and mm -hmm. it, struck, it struck me that we need more companies to experiment. What, what's been the result? I mean, we I mean, absolutely need to experiment even more. And in fact, let me give you a concrete example and also answer your question. I think uh, it's actually very important that we understand what the difference between believing in the business case and promoting changes. That's really at the crux of my argument. My argument is that it's not just about wanting. It's good people like all of us here in this room who would like to have more gender equality but can't get around to doing it. I think that's actually really important to understand. These weren't really bad people who didn't want to hire female musicians on those orchestras. Maybe there were some sexists among them, but I don't actually think that's the main thing. But the main thing is that they couldn't see a woman with a trombone or a woman with drums. That just didn't agree with their gender stereotypes. So honestly, I think that's where we have to look. We have to make it easier for our biased minds to get it right. 
and that might be through quotas, but it might be through many other mechanisms. And much of my work is not on quotas, it is on behavioral types of interventions which equalize the playing field. So that's why I think it's actually really important to distinguish between want, what is it we want, and what is it we can do, given the minds that we have, and we can't easily exchange mm. those. So now I'm gonna to get to the experiment. I'm sorry, I had to get a bit passionate here, but I think it's actually an important point. Um, there's lots of things, by the way, that we want. We might want to diet, we want to um, exercise more. There's lots of things we want and don't get around to doing. So I'm thinking of gender diversity a bit like dieting or exercising. Um, okay, I'll see that like in the, <laughs> the front headlines of tomorrow's newspaper. Gender diversity equals exercising. Okay. Um, quick, quick comment on kind of experiments. Uh, yes, absolutely. We have to try out different things and organizations have to create learning environments. That's another passion of mine, a bit of another mission. That's why I'm so excited about what the public sector is doing in New South Wales. We don't have all the answers. And instead of just trying out something wholesale and rolling it out to all 400,000 employees that are in the public sector in New South Wales, much better for us to pilot something, to experiment with it, to just do what we have done in the natural sciences for a very long time. Have a treatment group which gets the medicine and have a placebo group which gets the placebo, that's your control group, and then you know what works and what doesn't work. So, for example, then you can better understand how you should evaluate someone. Should you really use, for example, potential when you evaluate someone's performance? Many organizations do both. They evaluate someone's past performance, but also future potential. We find that gender bias particularly creeps in an experiment, we find that when we include potential, because that's when we can see women as leaders. So yes, absolutely, experimentation is key, data is key, and learning, creating the kinds of environments that allow for learning is key. Great. There's a question here, and then I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up, I think. Yeah. Hi, my name is Caroline English. I'm a strategy consultant. At the firm I work at, we find that uh, we consistently, when we're rec recruiting young consultants, that we get um, out of university or people with a couple of years' experience, we get a ratio of around 30 to 70 women to men in our applications. And that makes some of us uh, say we're all the fantastic women and others say, well, we're not getting the application, so it's not our fault. Do you have any comment on what are the gender dynamics with young people, children and teenagers, and how that impacts um, your ambition and, and the kinds of issues that we see in the workplace now? Oh, good question. Who'd like to respond? Okay, um, uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to jump in here. Mm. Um, I'm actually going to rely on Andreas's work partly. So the recruitment process starts very, very early on. Um, and uh, it starts in school. It starts uh, with the kinds of uh, subjects that we tend to study, that we feel we're good at tends to be related to role models, so we can show that, for example, women are more likely to uh, do STEM types of uh, subjects when they are taught by a female role model, so it starts very early on. Um, but I totally get, you can't fix that as you know, an employer, but I'm just saying the selection process starts relatively early. Um, and then one of the things that you may want to look at again, and that is Andreas's work, is how you advertise. Is there jo some gendered language in your ads? Uh, or are you really trying to attract uh, both men and women in the same way? Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we also have to be very clear that there are pipeline issues. There really are fewer women, I don't know who you're trying to target, but there are fewer women in engineering than in psychology. So if you are particularly interested in engineers, you'll probably get 80% men and 20% women. If you're particularly interested in psychology and you don't get 80% women and 20% men, then there's probably something going on. So I think all of those are relevant questions. And then the last one is, you know, what are the stereotypes that are associated with your particular job? So maybe consultancy comes with, with um, stereotypes around time management. Maybe people think there's a lot of travel involved. Maybe that's not compatible with their lives. Maybe they want to start a family. So you know, that is kind of the next step that you have to take. If it's not in the ads, if the pipelines are okay, if your advertisements are okay, maybe there's something about the job that isn't compatible with what women want. Maybe they look for more flexibility. Maybe they look for more stability. Mm. I'm afraid um, 
we're out of time. I've got one, I'd like us all to be able to walk out of here tonight with one thing we could each do to uh, help work to gender equality in our organisations. Carol, I was taken by the, uh, that idea of employers um, doing the focus groups, which is part yeah. of the male champions process of listen, learn and lead. So that's going to be my, my one, splitting off organisation, the, the team to do that. What, um, if you had to do one thing, or if you'd recommend one thing what, yeah. differently, what's that? Well, what I encourage um, in the organisations that work, I work at mm -hmm. and that I have an influence over is to appoint women as spokespeople within the organisations, because what you often find is that um, the, the, because the male, you usually have a male CEO, that they are the spokesperson that, that the media, for example, will go to. So I always encourage CEOs, male CEOs, to appoint women in their organisations as spokespeople for different aspects of what the organisation does because I believe very much in role models. I believe very much in role models for women in business. And if we're not seeing women take on these roles as spokespeople for organisations, for, for uh, issues around business, finance, politics, then we're not going to believe that women are capable of doing those leadership roles. So that's what I encourage yeah. them to do, appoint spokespeople. And that's an ex ex excellent um, project, Women uh, in women Media. Women for Media, yeah. yeah. In institute. Andreas. Yes, yeah, so, so one of the things we heard about in the workshop is that men apply for promotion two years too early and, and women two years too late. So I guess there's, there's a relatively simple tool we can use to, to reduce this, and assuming this is right, but I believe it is. It's, it's giving women a signal that they're ready to be promoted, making the promotion uh, process transparent. Mm -hmm. What does it take to go beyond a certain threshold? I think that will help women over proportionally. We don't need to encourage most men to, to apply for promotion. But They'll for try anyway, but, but for women it, it may really help them, and that may create uh, more women uh, yeah. higher on the ladder. That's right. You could pay them the same amount too, which is something. <laughs> uh, Graham, and then yours. Um, I think, from my point of view, the most important thing that people, particularly in leadership roles, can do is drive a hard conversation in their organisations about what is really going on here. Because I think the point's been well made that reasonable people say, well, of course we want these things to happen. And so when they're not happening, they kind of shrug and say, well, you know, we're committed to them. Um, you've really got to interrogate what is going on in your organisation and depending on the answer to that question, think very hard about what you do to actually, in a concrete way, turn those things around. Thank you. Iris. So, um, it's going to be slightly unfair, but it's not what I would like to do, but I would like for all of you to do something. In fact, I'm applying behavioral insights that tell me that you won't do anything after having heard our discussion here unless you commit to doing something now. So, I'd love for all of you to think about something that you can do. In your organizations, maybe it is changing tests. Maybe you have to change the boxes and move them to the end. Maybe you want to commit to interviewing differently. Maybe you want to commit to counting to five. If you're a professor, always count to five before you call on any students because some of us have their hands up earlier than others. Whatever it might be that we've discussed today, choose something and make your mind up now and promise your better self that you'll actually do it tomorrow. Can you commit to that? <laughs> yes? Can we commit to that? Yes? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Carol, Andreas, Graham, and Iris thank Bonnet. Thank you so much for your thoughts tonight. Thanks to you. And back to you, Lisa. Pretty much done. Um, I want to thank the panel again and Narelle. I think the take takeaway, just being really brief, is um, remembering that's not always just about the business case. Uh, we should be thinking about the human rights case as well, as Iris reminded us. Perhaps we can look to India when we're thinking about increasing our representation 
on Parliament when we have two female cabinet ministers and the impact of having two female cabinet mm. ministers when it comes to business and the representation and uh, the way that business perceives this. Uh, Carol, you also provided so many tweetable quotes. Uh, we need paradigm shifts to change status quo. Absolutely agree with that. And thank you, Andreas, for uh, stirring the pot a bit and talking about quotas and targets, which is always a great way to get people fired up. Thank you very much, Graham. 400,000 people, a lot of work to do, but it's, it's great that you're working with Iris and her work and making sure it's based on evidence. So please, one more time, thank you, Iris Bonnet and our panel. <laughs>